Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Hey TBC, I'm Chloe Thomas. And I'm Blake Thomas. And today's scripture is out of John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, it's so good to be back with you. Finally, uh, we took a little bit of time off, me and my family did, uh, over the last few weeks just to kind of rest, orient ourselves for what is certain uh, to be an unprecedented kind of fall. Uh, and so good to be back with you. Good to be standing up while I'm doing this. Uh, I know I said I wanted to sit until we gathered again, but then uh, after some time off, I was like, you know, bad idea. I, I need to stand for something physically bad happens to me. And so, so grateful that you're here. Listen, where, wherever I've gone uh, in my time off, wherever I saw you, whether that was uh, online or uh, at a restaurant or at Walmart or over at Target or wherever we were, mask up, uh, you, you all ask me the same question. The question was some variation, some version of this. When will we finally gather again? Uh, and so I want to answer that question for you, right? Here it is. I'm going to give you the honest answers, as honest as I can be with you, as soon as we possibly can. Here's my promise to you. There isn't an elder or a staff member that's okay with where we've been, with not being able to gather in a way that is safe and makes us able to worship Jesus together. And so just so you know, on every agenda at exec, at the pastor, at elder, we're discussing, we're discussing when can we open. Uh, a couple of things I would like for you uh, to consider as we're working through some of that this week in multiple meetings. Uh, number one, we could use your prayers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, variables here, some that you know, some that you do not know, uh, that go into that decision. It's not simply, oh, this church is, so we can't. Uh, each church is unique in how it's built, in the services that it uses, and in, in whether or not COVID has blown through a certain aspect of their staff, rendering that an impossibility. And so I want you to pray Pray for wisdom as we meet. Pray that God would protect our staff. Pray that God would protect our people. That would be the first thing. Just pray for us. We want to gather. However much you want to gather, I can assure you, me being up here by myself, talking to a couple of machines, isn't my idea. Like, I, I want to feel you in the room with me. Like, sing voices lifted high to Jesus with me in this room. I want that. I'm hungry for it. You're hungry for it. We're going to try to get it done. But there are variables that we have to take into consideration for your safety and the safety of others that we are going to take into consideration. Pray for us. Secondly, please be gracious. Now, another church's opening does not mean that we are lazy or do not want to open or are overly passive. Uh, you, if you've been here with me and my 18 year old, there, there ain't much about me that screams passivity. Uh, and so I can promise you, we're not trying to be passive. We're trying to actually aggressive move the, move, aggressively move the ball forward. There are just variables that, that are beyond our control that, that we're asking God to work and move in. And maybe one day after all this is said and done, we can drink a cup of coffee together and I can share some of that with you. Uh, and so by the grace of God, will you pray with us and will you continue to be gracious 
for us. There isn't a minister on the staff that isn't longing to see you, to hug you, to be in the lobby, to minister and pray after, uh, to greet and welcome and celebrate the presence of Jesus among his gathered people. And so pray with us, please, and then continue to be gracious. You're doing an exceptional job of that. Now, we're going to jump back into the Gospel of John, but before we do that, I, I wanted to do this real quick, all right? So, so look right at me. I know you're in your living room. So everybody dial in. Just, just look right up here. You are eight months into 2020. Now, normally we wouldn't take an eight month break and celebrate it, but here, like you're eight months and you're still here, right? Like you've made it. You have been um, supported by the spirit of God. You have endured. You have not been perfect. You have blown it. You have done some things that maybe you're uh, ashamed of, but here you are struck, but still here, weary, but still gathering. So here's what we're going to do just real quickly. We're going to celebrate with one another. We're going to encourage one another that eight months in, we're still standing by the grace of God. And so give somebody a high five right now. I don't, I don't, if you're by yourself, you just self high five yourself. All right. So let's go. Everybody just celebrate for a second. You're eight months in and you're still here, right? Maybe you lost a job. Maybe uh, you, you're so anxious and frustrated and angry, but here, you're still here. You're still, we just sung to Jesus. We're hanging in there. We're being sustained by the grace of God. I'm proud of you, right? Mom and dad, uh, educator, you've made some really hard decisions. And I want you to hear me say this. Look right at me. You didn't make the wrong one. You didn't make the wrong one. If you decided I'm going to send my kid to school, great. If you said, well, no, I'm a little too, I'm gonna just do on home. Uh, I'm just, we're just gonna homeschool this year. Praise God. Well, I can't do homeschool. I will hurt this kid. We're gonna do some variation of the two. Praise God. You didn't make the wrong call. You just made a call and I'm proud of you. I'm also proud that you have never stopped uh, across six months now. Uh, you have not stopped loving God and loving people, the sheer volume of stories of people who have come to know Christ, of idols that have been stripped away out of the hearts of people as we moved from event-based Christianity to Christianity in our neighborhood. You have been faithful. And maybe you're sitting in your living room right now and you're going, man, I don't, you don't know me. You ain't seeing what I'm, I, I ain't been faithful. Well, you're tuning in right now, sister, brother. You're tuning like you're hanging in there. You've come back wanting to sing the word of God and hear the word of God. And in some way, even though dimly and faintly, you're like, I want the presence of God in my life. You've done exceptionally well as fall stuff is kicking off. Uh, man, I've just been geeked out at all of the stuff I'm hearing. Like uh, many of you right now are with your home group in a living room watching this live stream. You've gathered in these small pockets. We didn't organize it. You chose to do it. And, and man, that's exciting to me that you're like, you know what? We're going to gather. I know we can't big gather, but let's small gather and let's sit under the word of God and let's encourage one another. Let's brunch it up and, and, and celebrate Jesus together. And so I've been super. And then I want you to hear this. We opened up class, fall class registration uh, seven days ago. Over 2,000 men and women have signed up for our Bible study classes this fall. Like that's a reason to celebrate over 2,000 people. Now, let me, just with that said, let me just, let, gotta, I can't, some things on camera don't worry. I wanna, wanna press just a little bit. Uh, the numbers right now uh, very much are in favor of women joining Bible study classes. Uh, like I think the last count I saw, which was Tuesday, maybe it got better, was 24 to one, which means for every 24 women we have in Bible study, we have one man. Men, look right at me. That ought not be so. Man, just look right. It, it ought not be so, brothers. So I, I'm making, you, you need to hop online, sign up for either men's Bible study or Christian story or Christian belief. You gotta find some place to feed your soul with the word of God. So, so I wanna encourage you, like over 2,000 people locally, over 1,000 locally, and then over 1,000 more that are as far away as Japan or Canada or Australia are jumping on to study the book of Psalms with us, to study Christian story with us, to study Christian theology with us, to get in and and be trained in doctrine and life with us. And so these are reasons to celebrate, like God is at work in the mess. That was not a tagline for happy seasons. That was a tagline for this exact moment. God is doing things. He's accomplishing things. Whether we can see it in a gathered room or not, God will not be slowed down 
by such small things or such big things as a virus. And so with all, I just wanted you to hear me say those things before we got to I'm proud of you. Gosh, I love being your pastor. You've made me love it all the more in this mess, watching you navigate it, watching you learn on the fly, watching you own your faith all the more, watching you take hold of rhythms that you wanted to establish to continue to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And man, I couldn't be more proud of you. Now, in 2019, we started working through the Gospel of John. Uh, in fact, we covered John 1 through 6 in 16 weeks. So, so that 1 through 6 in 16 weeks. And then we paused because there were some things that we believed we needed to address uh, about the long-term vision uh, of our church. So we pressed pause and I told you we were gonna come back to it. And I heard all sorts of snarky comments about how, well, you never came back to Luke, which is not true. Uh, and, and so here we are back in John. And over the next 10 weeks, we are going to cover John 7 through John 21. Uh, and if you're, if you're doing the math in your head and you're going, hey, Matt, you, you took 16 weeks to do chapters one through six, and now you're telling us seven through 21, you're doing in 10? Yes. And that's going to require uh, you to put on a different kind of lens as we walk through the Gospel of John. Uh, what I mean by that is if you remember when we were walking through the book of Exodus and there were times that we would take two or three chapters at a time, pull an anchor text out, and then show how the context supported that main point. You'll see us do that quite a bit over the next 10 weeks. I wish we could take it more slow. I wish we could hang out in John for the next three years. But I want to, in October, spend a couple of weeks on the election. I just feel like it's going to be good and right for us to let the word of God bear its weight on this moment in human history. Um, and I know many of you already are a little anxious about what that might mean, but I probably, we're just going to let the book drive us. We're going to let the book set the ground for us. So we're going to dive in, uh, in in late October, right? The week before, two weeks before and the week after the election. We're just going to look at what the word of God says about a people, the people of God being citizens of heaven in a given local government and participating as citizens whose loyalty ultimately isn't to their country, but to the kingdom. More on that in a few months. So the, the Gospel of John, if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn uh, to John chapter 20. Uh, we're just going to look uh, at one verse and then we're going to do a flyover of those 16 weeks we did in the fall of 19. Now, the Gospel of John looks and feels different than the other three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. And they share uh, similar timelines, similar stories. They, they almost read identically in, in multiple places. Well, the Gospel of John is set from a different perspective. It's written in a different way. It doesn't follow the same chronological order. And it has some of the more beautiful stories about the life of Jesus. John is, he's arranged things. He, he's happy about this number seven, which biblically is like the perfect number. Uh, so there are seven miracles showing Jesus's divinity. There are seven I am statements. And by the way, we've preached through those I am statements. It'd be a good idea for you to circle back if you want and listen to those I am statements, because I won't be able to kind of dial down into that statement like I was able to do back in 19. Uh, there's the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the woman at the well, one of my favorite passages in all of scripture, John chapter four, there's Nicodemus coming to Jesus and saying, we know that you're from God because nobody can do these things you're doing if they're not from God. Tell me, how do I get into the kingdom? And many of you have, that have watched uh, the show, The Chosen, saw Nicodemus and Jesus interacting. That's from the gospel of John. We see the washing of the disciples' feet. We see the high priestly prayer of Jesus. All of these are in the Gospel of John. But let me tell you why I'm most excited to dive back in, in this moment, to the Gospel of John. John allows us to see and marvel at Jesus, fully human, fully divine. And when you and I set our eyes, set our hearts on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, according to the book of Hebrews, instead of our circumstances, instead of our frustrations, our bedrock turns 
to joy and peace rather than frustration and anxiety. And, and if there's anything you need right now, if there's anything I need right now, if there's anything we need right now, it is for the unknown aspects of our future, the frustrations of our current moment to be melted away by gazing upon the beauty of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so that's what we're going to do over the next 10 weeks. Now, the purpose of the book of John, it's really like, like you don't have to grab a giant uh, theological journal or a commentary because John just comes out and says it. This is why I'm writing this down. And so if you have your Bibles, let's look together. Uh, this is John chapter 20. We're going to look in verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So Jesus did a lot of other things that just weren't written in this book. Now, now surely at some level, this is common sense. He lived three years. So, so the Gospels don't kind of hold every little thing that happened in three years. So anything that's not written down is kind of conjecture. But, but what we have written down, we have written down for a specific purpose. And here's the purpose that you and I are holding the gospel of John in our hands right now. Look at verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, listen to this, that you may have life in his name. So there's my outline. There it is. That, that John has been given to us. The gospel of John has been given to us so that you might believe in three things. One, that Jesus is the Christ. Two, that he is the son of God. And that three, in believing that, you might have life in his name. That one's gonna be huge. That's like a pillar of mine, but more on that when we get there. Let's start with the first phrase. Jesus is the Christ. The claim here is that Jesus is, is the savior of the world. Look right at me. Not of good people, not of put together people, not even of the people that you would think, but rather he's the savior of the world. We see this, if you remember back in chapter one, starting in verse 12, here, here's what he said. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Listen to this. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So God, Jesus is the Christ, the savior of the world, that those who would believe in his name would become, listen to this, children of God, so that God becomes our father, our loving, kind father, our um, supporter, our provider, the lover of our souls. And how did this happen? This is great, not by bloodline. Just because your parents were Christians don't make you a Christian. Not, not by the will of man. You didn't white knuckle yourself into the kingdom of God. If you are a child of God, that has been a gift, a free gift of God's grace lavished upon you. You see this throughout the first part of John. Look at who he chooses as his disciples. Like if you ever just wanted to do a study that would encourage your own soul in regards to how God sees you and delights in you and loves you, just study who he picked as disciples. Like I, I've, I've said this before, like, like most of this crew would not pass like, like our HR policies to come on staff at the village church, right? You, you can't be as violent as Peter, as doubting as Thomas, as passive as, right? You, you, you just can't be what these disciples are and, and work here. And yet these are the guys that Jesus is picking. And if you follow the story, like they rarely get it right. So think about that. Who is Jesus crazy about? Who does Jesus say, save? Who does he bring into his confidence? Not the best, not the perfect, not those who have all their stuff together. It's almost the opposite. It's like if you're broken, confused, lonely, longing, I'm, you're my people, you're my guy. Like we see this there in chapter four. We see this at the, at the well when Jesus sees a Samaritan woman who, whose life's a wreck. It's the middle of the afternoon. She's come to the well. Nobody comes to the well in the middle of the afternoon. It's scorching hot. She's filled with shame, with self-hate. She's had five husbands, and the man that she was currently living with at this time was not her husband. And so what does Jesus do? This is a Samaritan. Uh, this is a woman. The, this is a woman who's had five husbands and is currently exchanging sex for rent. What does Jesus do? Jesus, this is the first person that Jesus says, I am the Messiah too. He hadn't even told his disciples yet. 
But this is the woman. And so maybe you've got a background. Maybe you've got a present reality where you feel dirty and far from God and like you could never measure up. Look right at me. Well, that means you're Jesus' kind of people. Like it's you, he wants to go, hey, come this way. And he does surgery on this woman's soul. He says, woman, go get your husband. I don't have a husband. And she said, I know you don't have a husband. And, and then he touches that place. Will you bring that to me? Will you bring that shame to me? Will you bring your self-hate to me? Will you bring your anger to me? It's like these things that we want to hide from Jesus. Those are the very things that Jesus is like, hey, will you bring that here? Will you bring that here? He's the savior of the world. He, like, like here's, here's what also this means, and I, I've got to hurry. I, I, when I'm gone for a while, and then I'm going to get back, and I'm like, oh. Um, if Jesus is the savior of the world, please just dial in right now. I think this is for us. If Jesus is savior of the world, that means no other savior is actually going to work. So one of the things, if we'll pay attention, that's being exposed right now is things in normal season, things when everything's going right, that we go to as our savior have been exposed as being no savior at all. So our response to those being exposed can be anger or frustration, or it can be repentance from an idol that we had put hoped in, hoped in, but now has been exposed as no God at all and replace our hope in the salvation that comes from Christ alone. Let me give you two big ones. Um, I know where we live. I know the opportunities we have in this community. And I, one of the big idols in this area is the idol of comfort. Like when we walked through core idols years ago and we wrote out what was the most common idol in our church and we brought them up, and laid them at the foot of the cross. When we looked through those, I mean, it was 90% comfort. Uh, I worship the idol of comfort. I want to be comfortable. I don't want to be stressed out. I, I want comfort, comfort, comfort. Well, what's happened in this season is that all the ways that we tried to find comfort have evaporated. Have you got to the end of Netflix yet? Have you exhausted that? Are you now desperate to find to figure out how you might find comfort? Uh, have you started drinking maybe a little too much? Have you started to kind of numb out in other ways because you can't get it? Well, here's what's happening. You're finding that comfort makes a crummy God. That although you've gone to worship comfort, you have found her lacking. You know why? Because Jesus is the Savior of the world. Second place around here is control. If it's not comfort, it's control. If you have not at some level had part of your heart exposed by not being able to control the things that you're used to being able to control, then, then I need you to teach me. <laughs> right? Like what has this season done? Well, it's shown us that we really aren't as in control as we thought we were. Like anybody have a trip canceled? Anybody had a celebration they were geeked out about? Anybody was eager for this, eager for that, and it just slipped through your fingers? Then you remember the sadness that maybe turned into anger, that maybe turned into resentment. Everywhere I go, people are like, I'm over it. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, I'm over it, but we're not over it, but we're over it. Right? So what's happening is things that we have gone to for comfort, things that we have gone to and we have worshipped have been exposed as being no God at all. Why? Because Jesus is the savior of the world. And, and that's what, if you will, go to Jesus and say, I want the comfort that only you can bring. You have said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Give me rest. I am weary. I am heavy laden. You will find rest from Jesus that transcends the circumstances of life. And gosh, just that you're tuned in this morning lets me know that you're serious about clinging to him. So continue to do so. I want to remind you that you're not the one holding on. He is holding on to you. You are his, which brings me to the second point. The, the second point is Jesus is the son of God. Now this is huge because it means that you and I are not following some philosophy of life or some morality. We're following the second person of the Trinity. Jesus Christ, man, is the son of God. Second person of the Trinity has always been, will always be the creator of all things. We read about this in chapter one, starting in verse one. In the beginning was the word, the Greek word there, 
logos. It was how the Greeks talked about the ultimate point of the universe. So in the beginning was the logos, the word, Jesus. And the word was with God and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And so this is Jesus, the savior of the world. How, that's, how is that possible? Because he's the son of God. Because he's co-eternal with the father. He has always been, he will always be and he has created everything. And we see this as we walk through the gospel of John. We see him turn water into wine. That's not a parlor trick. He does that because he's the son of God. He made water, all the molecules that make up water. He made wine, much to the Baptist chagrin, with, with all that goes into that. And so we can just tell water to be wine and it obeys. Why? Not because he's a magician, because he's the son of God. We watch him heal the official son in chapter four. He doesn't even go to the official son. The official son runs up to him and says, my son is sick. I've got word that he's gonna die. Will you please come? And Jesus says, why do you guys always need a miracle and a sign? And he says, please, my son will die. Jesus moves with compassion, says, your son is well. The father believed it, turned and headed towards home. And, and before he even got home, another servant met him. This is a phenomenal story and said, your son has been made well. The fever left his body, said, when did that happen? happen? And the servant said, about the seventh hour, which was the exact time that the official was talking to Jesus. How is that possible? Was that luck? Was that, maybe that's our Western plausibility structure. Man, Jesus really lucked out on that one, but it wasn't luck. He's the son of God. Only the son of God from a distance can say, I rebuke you, illness, and have it leave this little boy. We see this again in a crippled man of 38 years in chapter five. 38 years, crippled, on a mat, unable to move. And Jesus just says, hey, do you want to be healed? What a great question. Do you actually want to be healed? Is your identity so wrapped up in your sickness that you don't want to be healed? Or do you want to be healed? The man makes an excuse. Well, you know, nobody will help me go down when an angel stirs up the water. People get in there before I can get in. So he doesn't even answer Jesus' questions, but that doesn't stop Jesus from saying, take up your mat and walk. Who does that? Jesus does that. Why? Because he's a magician? No, because he's the son of God. He has always been. He will always be. He, he is the king sovereign over everything that exists. He and he alone says to demons, says to diseases, says to the natural order, you will do my will and they do his will. We could keep going here, but I need to hurry. He walks on water in chapter six and he feeds 5,000 people, more than likely 12, 15,000 people with a kid's lunch. So contextualizing this text, he takes a lunchable from some kid's little basket, the tuna fish one. And he opens it up and, and he feeds like 15,000 people so that they were like all these Lunchables left when they were done. Who does that? Jesus does that. And, and here's what I want you to hear me say to you. Do you know who's on your side today? Do you know who sees you today? Do you know who keeps track of every tear, of every hurt, of every loss, of every frustration, of every bit of anger. You know who sees it? You know who has your back? You know who's there? Jesus, the son of God. We do not worship and follow some passive, can't do anything about the brokenness in the world, God. We serve God at work in the mess. He sees you, he's with you. You have not been abandoned. Now, here's the last one, and this is like a pillar for me. The last phrase says that we, that you may have life in his name. So life in his name is speaking to this idea of union with Christ or what we've called in other series, withness. So that you and I might have life in Jesus, not life outside of Jesus, but life inside of Jesus. Now, what I mean by my pillars is there are three pillars that the Lord's made clear to me over the years that are just part of who I am. The first is biblically serious, like long, like I love the word. I want to preach the word of God, proclaim the God of the Bible. The second one would be spiritually alive. There's life in Jesus and I so desperately want you to have it. I don't want you to know about them. I don't want you to just have principles. I don't even want you to kind of master the high arts of doctrine. I want you to see and savor and love and have life in Jesus. 
It's not that those other things aren't important. It's that those things feed life in Jesus or you're doing them wrong or you're doing them wrong. So look at, we see this in John 1, 4 through 5. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, if there was ever a season for you and I to go, there's life in Jesus and there's life in Jesus that darkness cannot overcome. Now, now maybe you're close to feeling overcome. Maybe you're just about to tap out. Maybe you just don't know how much longer you can do this. And I'm not just talking COVID. I'm not just talking about all that. I'm just talking about in the deeper parts of your heart. I want to bring your attention and maybe even reframe something. And I'm going to come back to this later on in John because I think it's a, it's a change that we all need to make and I need to teach around it, okay? He, here, here's what we see happening. Jesus has all the array, uh, all, all the armament of darkness against him. Satan himself face against him. Fractured, broken world because of sin aimed against him. Secular powers, Rome aimed against him. Religious powers, Sadducees, Pharisees aimed against him. Even his own disciple betrayed him unto death. And Jesus is crucified on the cross. And we rightly gaze upon that as the wrath absorbing um, sin lifting sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. And yet what needs to be celebrated as much, if not even more than the cross of Jesus Christ is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? So how does Jesus triumph over sin, over Satan, over secular powers, over religious powers, over floundering, faltering, failing disciples with the resurrection Well, what's the good news of the gospel? Yes, that your sins are forgiven, but all the more that you have life in his name. The Christian life is not just blew it again. Let me ask for forgiveness. Blew it again. Ask for forgiveness. Blew it again. Let me ask for forgiveness. We will need the ongoing ethic of confession and repentance. But Christ has come so that you might have life, so that you might be made alive in him. So that the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and union with Christ would lead to life and life to the full. He he says this, says this to Nicodemus in chapter three, one through three. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look look right at me. We see it, the woman of well, he's often her streams of living water bubbling out from her soul. In chapter six, the people wanted bread. Just give us something to eat. And what does Jesus say? I am the bread of life. You don't need bread, you need me. I'm the bread of life. Over and over and over, we see this. Jesus is after the transformation of souls, not behavioral modification. As long as the lenses on your life are perpetually, I'm a terrible person. There, there, there's, I can't believe that God would ever even love me or use me. And you don't start to embrace that Christ has come, that you might have life. And that the resurrection means that you've been given a new heart. You've been given a new heart by the spirit of God to awaken you to the beauty of the kingdom of God. And you've been empowered to walk in it. Doesn't mean we're not gonna have to fight sin. If anything, it means you're in a fight that's bigger than you can fathom. It's time we start fighting back a little bit, right? This is what we see. There's life in his name and he wants you to have that life. I'm gonna end the sermon today with a simple quote from Friedrich Bruner. He says this, come into union with the word who made you and you will come to life. You came from him, please come back to him. You were made for him. The result of this reunion will be more than human existence. Look at me, it will be human life. Two questions as I end. The the first question would simply be this. What right now, like let's boil it down. What right now is distracting you from looking to Jesus, the Christ, the son of God? 
So, so if you think about it, maybe, maybe the distraction is, well, man, my, my spouse has lost her job or I've lost my job. Or maybe the, maybe the frustration is I'm, I don't, I hate the way we're doing school. I, I, need, I, I need a break here. Maybe the frustration is, oh, we had all these plans and these plans have been ruined. Maybe the frustration is just like, I've been in the house with these people. I'm learning. I don't care for them. Maybe, the, I don't know. I don't know what the, but, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I, I want you to name that. And then I want this week, as you think about that, to stop yourself and instead turn and fix your eyes on Jesus, right? This is the point of the gospel of John, that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he is the Christ and that in him you might have life. Well, if your whole focus, your whole concentration is about how bad this is or how bad this stinks or what you wish over here, here's what I ask you, whatever that thing is that's taunting you right now, Whatever that thing is right now that's pestering you right now, stealing your joy, robbing you of life. When you think about it this week, I want you to pay attention. And then when it pops into your head, I want you to go, nope. Then I want you to turn and face Jesus. You can do that by reading the gospel of John. You can do that by just uh, awkward, wonky prayers of just like, Jesus, I don't want to. I want to think about you, Jesus. I want to marvel at your goodness. I want to celebrate your life. I want to rejoice in who you are. I want you to fight this week. Why? Because Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of God. And in him, in your believing, there is life in his name. He sees you. He loves you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Even as we've gathered, maybe just as a family unit, maybe just as a single man or a single woman, maybe just um, with, with, with friends in a different space, we just come to you and we ask you, lift up our heads turn our eyes, turn our hearts back to you. God, with all the things that are frustrating us right now, making us angry right now, stealing our joy right now, I just pray in the name of Jesus, spirit of the living God, that you would help us see it this week. At the first little inkling of the thought that we would see it, we would see it as being from hell and that we'd make war against it. We'd make war by worshiping you, turning our eyes to gaze upon you and marveling at your beauty and grace. Jesus, we Love you. Help us. You are at the center of it all. You are the point of it all. Help us. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.